All right, welcome back. So the last video we took a look to find out what the exposure triangle that we see here was all about. Today we're gonna to be using aperture, ISO, and shutter speed combinations to control the exposure inside of the camera. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at what a meter looks like inside of the camera. All right, so the next thing that we have here is this is our meter inside of our camera. If you look at your viewfinder or sometimes on the back of an LCD, you're going to see some numbers like this. And you're going to see a zero, a minus one, a minus two, a plus one, and a plus two. And in between it, we have some little ticks. These little ticks stand for third of stop. So this would be plus one third, and this would be minus one third. And the reason they have that is because digital cameras need to be more accurate than just adjusting at half f-stops like old cameras or using full f-stops. So down here we have this little tick mark and this is gonna move and it could be red, it could be green, it really just depends on your camera. So as this moves, it's telling you where your exposure is. So right here at zero would be what the camera thinks is the correct exposure. Now, just because the camera thinks the exposure is correct doesn't always mean that it's an accurate exposure. There's a few different factors that come into this, and we'll get into those later. They're a little bit more advanced, but for just learning how to basically use your camera, you're gonna wanna try to get this at zero. The good news is it's most likely gonna be really close to being a good exposure. Now, the camera meters in a couple different ways, and we have those located down here. The first is a matrix where it's 60-40, meaning it's taking in 60% of this area and 40% of this area. This is what we call an average weighting system where it's looking at the whole scene. This is the most common method used in photography. The next thing that we have is called center weighted, so we're using 10 degrees, and so we're looking at this center area right in here. This would allow you to put that on that area and try to get an accurate exposure for that very specific location. Let's say that half of your frame was lit with light and the other half was dark. If you wanted the exposure from the lit side or the side with the sun, you could place this in an area where it's getting light. And by isolating the meter to a specific area, it's gonna give you a more accurate representation of your exposure. Same thing with spot metering down here. Spot metering is a more narrow point and it allows you to get on a very specific area. Now, I don't know how much people actually change the metering modes anymore. The cool thing about digital is you can actually see your exposure on the back of the camera. Now, back in the day with film, when you couldn't see what you were doing, these were really important and they really saved you a lot of times with getting the correct exposure. But now with being able to look at your LCD, you could probably get away with just using matrix or any one of these single modes to get your exposure because it does allow you to look on the back of your camera. But if you wondered what these different options did and when to use them, that's a little information on the different metering methods. Now, one thing we should take a look at before we go any further is what does a camera meter from? So right here, we have what we are going to represent as a gray card. And if you've ever heard of a gray card, they were used a long time ago to accurately get exposures for a camera. The camera actually meters for 18% gray, and this is about what 18% gray would look like. And you can try to find things in real life because most people aren't carrying around a gray card to give you an accurate meter. What's important to know about this is if you were to measure something that's pure white, your exposure would be underexposed, meaning it would be too dark. And if you meter something with a lot of black, you're gonna get an exposure that's way overexposed because it's trying to read the exposure from pure black. When you're metering, you wanna try to meter something that's around 18% gray. So if you are white and you measure the palm of your hand, that was once considering a good thing that was close to about 18% gray. So how do we adjust this to get the correct exposure? Well, the first thing you know, if you don't see this little dot, 
anywhere in here, that means that you are so far off that it's not even close. So let's start from the beginning, not looking at the meter, but how we use ISO, aperture, and shutter speed to actually adjust the exposure. Now, when I start photographing a situation, I walk into the area where I'm gonna be photographing and I determine where I should set my ISO so I can adjust my shutter speed and aperture so that I can take the type of images that I wanna take. Right down here, we have 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400. And these are just some whole stops. Yes, just like before, you're gonna have third stop increments, so there are gonna be numbers in between these. And your ISO will go much further past 6400. However, most cameras don't go below 100. So down here, you can see we have two things. One, it says it needs more light. And that is referring to the sensor. It needs more light to make an exposure, but it means that the sensor is less sensitive and that is why it needs more light. So in today's sensors, what happens is we set the sensitivity of the sensor by gain. And 100 is not very sensitive to light. So to make the correct exposure, you're gonna need to give it a lot of light, just like it would be out on a sunny day. So if it's a sunny day, you're usually gonna set your ISO at 100 to 200, and you should be good to go to get good working parameters for your aperture and your shutter speed. Over here, you'll notice it needs less light, meaning this is for like a dark location. You need less light to make an exposure at 6400, because your sensor is more sensitive. So right here, we've got these general terms, and this will give you a good starting point. Are there times when you, on a sunny day when you need to set it at 400? Absolutely. But in general, if it's a sunny day, you can set your ISO usually at 100 to 200. If it's cloudy outdoors, you can use somewhere between 400 and 800. Or if it's darker outside or you're indoors and not using a tripod, you're most likely going to need to set your camera at 1600 to 3200, if not higher. These are going to give you a good starting point. And remember, not only does ISO control light, it also controls the quality of your image. So at 100, you're going to have the best quality image. And as you move up, it's going to reduce the image quality and start to add noise to your image. The next thing that we have here is aperture. As you can see down here, this would be inside of your lens. This is your diaphragm or iris, and this is controlling the size of that opening. Now, the odd thing that we run into here is the small number, also referred to as an f-stop, so this would be f2, f2.8, and so on, is the largest opening. It defies a little bit of logic, and this confuses people at time, especially in the beginning, because they would associate the large opening with the large number, but it's the opposite of what you think. So the smaller number is the larger opening, and it's letting in the most amount of light. We refer to that as fast. So in photography, there are fast lenses and slow lenses. Usually your fast lenses are your pro lenses and they are much more expensive than your basic lenses. Your basic lenses usually have a minimum aperture of f4, if not higher, and your fast lenses are 2.8 and faster. Now your aperture controls two different options. One is light, so you can see up here, more light, the larger the opening, less light, the smaller the opening. They also control what we call depth of field, meaning what is in focus. So if you were to imagine that this is what we focused on and we have a little aperture here behind it and something in front of it. So if we focused on this field right here, how much this way and this way is in focus. If we had a shallow depth of field, maybe only from here to here is in focus. And if we had a wide depth of field, maybe from here here would be in focus. So we're talking about from the point of focus, how much this way and this way is in focus. 
So if we want a shallow depth of field, like we would see maybe in a portrait where your background is completely blurred, we want to shoot with a low aperture. If we want everything to be in focus, like maybe a landscape, we want to shoot with a higher aperture. So we're going to control these numbers to get that type of photo. Unlike ISO, aperture and shutter speed are really determining how the image is going to look. ISO does affect the noise in the image, but really the two main functions are going to be aperture and shutter speed. And aperture is controlling that depth of field in the image. And a lot of times this needs to be very specific for a photographer because they're trying to do something with that image so it has a certain feel or a certain look. So not only are we setting this to get the correct exposure, but more importantly, we're setting this to get the correct depth of field in our image. The last thing we have here is shutter speed and shutter speed controls motion. So down here, I have some little icons representing motion and I'm going to explain what these mean because this is unusual because I have two different ones and there's a very specific reason for that. And down here we have in whole stops again, some shutter speed examples. So we have 15 and this is written as 1 15th. So 1 30th of a second, 1 60th of a second. But usually we just see the number. So we just say 125, 250. It's too long to say 1 500th of a second. Then 1000 and 2000. Most cameras go up to about 8000 and they'll go down to about 30 seconds if you need to have an exposure that long. After that, you will see something called B, which stands for bulb. And what bulb means is as long as you hold your shutter down, you can take the picture. And then when you release your shutter button, it's going to stop taking the picture. For some reason, you needed to take a two minute exposure. You'd have to stand there, hold down that button for two minutes and then let go of it. So just like everything else, this is whole stops and we have third of stops in here. So you will see numbers in between this. So this would actually go 30, 40, 50, 60. So when you are shooting a slower shutter speed, meaning the shutter is opening and then closing slower, that's going to allow more light to get into your camera. And as you have a faster shutter speed that it opens and closes really quickly, it's going to let less light into your camera. Now down here, we have two numbers in colors. We have 60 and 500. Let me explain why we have those two numbers highlighted. Now these are general terms. There's a couple different ways that this is specified. We're just going to stick with this one because we need to make this simple. 60th is about a slow of a shutter speed that you can take a handheld photo of a non-moving subject. So if your subject is not moving like a portrait, they're just sitting there and you are hand holding your camera, that's about the minimum or the slowest you would want to take a picture. Now shooting at 1 25th of a second would be much better because you are reducing the chance for a little bit of motion blur and so on. You could easily shoot a portrait or a non-moving subject at 2,000th of a second. It's not going to hurt your image. Remember, this is 60th of a second. As you go below 60th to 30th or 15th of a second, you might start introducing what we call motion blur. So you can see here where it's a little bit fuzzy and your eyes and everything in the image will just be a little bit soft. So you want to try to stay away from taking handheld photos below a 60th of a second because you can introduce this motion blur because you cannot hold your camera still enough to take photos of that subject. Now, can you do it at 30th if you're really still and you brace yourself? Absolutely. So the next icon we have is 500th of a second and 500th of a second is the minimum shutter speed to stop motion. Meaning if something is moving, so if someone is like walking or maybe a slow jog, you can stop that at a 500th of a second. However, if something is moving fast, like sports action, 500 is not going to be fast enough to stop that action. You're going to need to jump up to a thousandth of a second or even better, two thousandth of a second. It really determines on what you're trying to photograph. And the only way you can figure this out is to go out and practice and try the different variations of numbers to find out what works best for you. So what we're going to do is use these combination of numbers 
with shutter speed, aperture, and ISO to get a correct exposure by using our meter. So the way that we're gonna move this little dot is the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and set that ISO. So let's say we're outside and it's sunny, we would set our ISO to 100 or 200. And then we wanna determine what we wanna do with our image. So if we are taking a picture of a landscape image, remember we might want a large depth of field. So we might wanna have a high aperture number. So let's say we wanna set it at F11. So we're gonna set that aperture at F11. Don't worry about your exposure being correct at this point. Then you want to adjust your shutter speed, which is gonna be your last number. And we wanna adjust that until this little tick mark gets on the zero. And then we know we're gonna have the correct exposure. Now you do need to pay attention, because remember, if you are hand holding your camera and your shutter speed is lower than 60th of a second, it's gonna blur no matter what you do, even though you have a large depth of field. You always have to pay attention to what you are setting the numbers at because just because you can set them and get a good exposure, that doesn't always mean that your photo is gonna come out looking how you thought it would. Now, if we were taking a picture of action, so let's say we're taking a picture of our friend riding their motorcycle. We're gonna set that ISO because it's sunny outside at 100 or 200. And then we're gonna sh set our shutter speed first this time. So I'm gonna set it at a thousandth of a second. Cause we need, cause we know to stop action, we need to have a fast shutter speed. And the minimum that I would set a camera for really fast movement is gonna be a thousandth of a second. Then we are going to adjust our aperture to get the exposure correct or more accurate. And then we'd be allowed to take that picture. Now, when you adjust your aperture, as long as you can adjust it and get it here, it's not gonna affect your image really, except for it's gonna either give you more depth of field or less depth of field. What happens is, let's say at a thousand, our depth of field to get the correct exposure was F11, and we don't really want that much depth of field. This is where something called equivalent exposures comes into effect. I'm gonna go ahead and switch on over and show you what equivalent exposures mean. Just because you get your meter right and your camera's gonna take the correct exposure, that doesn't always mean that they're the best settings for that specific image and what you're trying to achieve. So right here we have our ISO. Notice we have 6400, 3200, 16, and so on. Shutter speed starting at 30th of a second, 60th of a second. Notice 60 and 500, once again, are highlighted. So remember not to go below a 60th of a second. And for action, we need to be at 500 or higher. We have our aperture down here. And notice we have more light. Everything over here is adding more light to our image. Every number over here is adding less light to our image. So let's say we're taking a photo and the perfect settings are 60th of a second f5.6 at an ISO of 400. But all of a sudden something happens and we need to change our exposure. And the reason we might need to exchange our exposure is because let's say that our subject, as we can see down here, wasn't moving. So let's say all of a sudden something happens and this crazy person is running down the street and we need to adjust this so we have a faster shutter speed. So we can do something called an equivalent exposure. So let me take a second and I'll show you that. In this case, remember, we wanna go from 60th of a second up here to 500th of a second. These numbers are also in whole stop. So what this means is every time you go this way, you're doubling the amount of light that gets into your camera. And if you go this way, you're doubling the amount of light that doesn't get into the camera. So in this case, we're gonna go from 60th and we're gonna make these little humps to make this easier. So we're gonna go one, two, three. This means this is three stops less light, all right? So when we go here, we're letting three stops less light into the camera, one, two, three. So we need to compensate for three stops less light into the camera. One option that we can do 
is to let more light in because remember everything going this way is going to let more light in so if we go from 400 to 800 that's going to be one stop of light and if we go from 5.6 to 2.8 that's going to be one two one two three stops less light we're going to do one here two here and three here an equivalent exposure means this 60th at 5.6 at 400 is the same exposure of 500th of a second at 2.8 at an ISO of 800. So the picture exposure will be exactly the same. The image will look different because our settings are different. This one, it's gonna be able to stop action and it's gonna have a shallower depth of field. And the red one is gonna have a larger depth of field and not be able to stop action. So let me get rid of these green lines right here. All right, so let's take a look at a different example. So in this example, we have our shutter speed at 500th of a second. So that's gonna be one, two, three stops less light. So we need to compensate for that. In the image before we went one to 800 and then we moved five, six down to 2.8. In this case, we wanna leave our aperture at 5.6 so we can go one, two, three, up to 3200 and change our exposure. So we did less light here, three stops more light up here. An equivalent exposure of 65,600 is also 500, 3200. In this case, we have already got two instances of equivalent exposures, both giving us a different look. In this case, we're gonna have more noise in our image because we're moving up to a higher ISO. Remember, as you move up onto your ISO, one of the things you do is you lose image quality. All right, so for our last example, once again, we're gonna go one, two, three to 500. And in this case, we're gonna do one, two to 1600 and one down to F4. So we're letting less light in here and then two stops more light there and then one stop here. So here we had three stops less light, so we need to get three stops more light somewhere else, and we're adjusting that. In this case, our exposure is gonna be 500 F4 at 1600. So let's go ahead and take a look at all of those exposures. So right here, we can see all these different combinations. Remember our original exposure was 60th of a second, F5.6 at 400. And equivalent exposures are 500 to eight at 800, 500, 1600 at F4, and 500 at 3200. And those are all examples of equivalent exposures. Now in this case, we just did three alternate exposures, but you could obviously have more than that. So what we can learn from this is there's multiple ways to get the correct exposure so our image looks good but there's a bunch of combinations of equivalent exposures that will give us a completely different image. And this is why photographers shoot in manual, because these specific numbers are important as to how that photo looks. As we come back here to the meter, remember we were trying to center our little tick on the zero here and the reason we do that is because we need in photography to get a correct exposure. Well, hopefully that gets you started in photography and understanding how to adjust your ISO, your aperture and your shutter speed and use your meter to get something correctly exposed. So don't forget, I take my time and I put these videos out completely free. It would be great if everybody could give me a thumbs up and help that YouTube algorithm. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave those below. And if you have a more specific question, don't forget, look in the description down below. I have a Facebook page that allows you to post a picture or a video of your problem. And a lot of time that's helpful in me determining the information that I convey to you.